Okay, so in your mind, you should think of it like this. So we, we presented it in one way in one diagram, so we're just going to reinforce it uh, in another way, okay? We have a state at a certain time point T, okay? The agent gets to uh, decide what to do. So this is this yellow arc, okay? So it takes uh, a valid action um, that it knows it can try, okay, at time T. And then uh, it's going to get to a new state. So basically this is the unfolding, right? The agent makes a decision, the environment tells us what states we're in, the agent makes a decision, the uh, state, uh, the environment tells us what state we're in, okay, uh, and so forth. So you can think of it like that, okay. Um, what we're going to do is think of also the reward process, right? So we can think of the reward process as having two parts, right? So I'm in a state. Uh, in the MRP, when I leave the state, I get a reward. In the MDP, I have a case where I'm in a state, the agent makes a particular decision about what to do, and then conditioned on both, meaning I have this arc here, I am going to decide what value I'm going to get at the next time step, right? So this is the reward for the next time step, okay? Actually, we can write it in any way we, we want to. It's just to say that the reward for doing something at time t comes at time t plus one, okay? So again, if you were to think about the uh, Markov reward function, it would be just something like this because we don't have these things down here, okay? So uh, in the reward function, we just say we're at time t, and then the reward happens at time t plus one, just like the Markov decision process, but we have actions here as well, okay? So we're going to uh, continue to do that recursively, uh, sorry, iteratively, and then we'll get uh, a, a number of rewards, okay? So you can see here that basically the top line that we are getting is basically our value function. It's basically telling us all of the different rewards that we're getting. And our value function is basically computed based on this, right? When we get to a particular state here, what we're trying to estimate is this value, okay? This value about what is all of the future rewards all get together so that we can evaluate how good it is to be in this state and take this particular action, okay? To take that particular action, okay? When we've taken that particular action, uh, we know we're going to get reward uh, RT, okay? And we know uh, from simulation or uh, some estimation that we might get all of the following rewards, okay? And we're gonna add them all together to get an idea of what is the total value of being in state ST and taking action AT, okay? Now, uh, that's the goal of the action, uh, sorry, the uh, state value function, right? What we want to actually do is don't really care about that, but we want to perform optimally, right? Have the right behavior. So our policy, right, our pi is basically our playbook to tell us what actions we're going to do given this information, right? I'm at state T, I need to pick something that I'm going to do. I'm gonna to try to make sure my playbook is optimized to get the best possible um, uh, behavior, right? In terms of uh, return. Okay, so I mentioned the idea of return. So let's uh, make it clear what that is. Actually, in lots of lectures uh, and in the original um, reinforcement learning book that everyone refers to, it's also called utility, okay? Uh, we're following a different set of terminology that comes from David Silver, who's one of the open AI uh, folks, um, sorry, the deep mind folks who, who work on uh, you know, the, the game playing agents, okay? And so he turns, uh, ter terms it return, okay? So you can think of return and utility as being synonymous with each other. And they just make the idea that we take the entire set of rewards. So remember, rewards are conditioned are specified to a particular time step, okay? So I have time step at uh, uh, a T where I get the reward at uh, T plus one, okay? I have the time step uh, T plus two where I get the reward for doing something at T plus one, okay? So I'm gonna sum up all of these together all the way until the end of my episode, right? It could go on forever, whatever, uh, but if it's terminal, of course, I won't have an infinity up there, right? Okay, and uh, the only thing that we are going to say is that, you know, maybe I want to interpret future rewards from immediate rewards a little differently. So I'm going to add in this gamma that we sort of saw, but not uh, properly uh, given any mathematical definition before, okay? So the discount factor is basically a penalty, right? It's basically saying, how much do I care 
about future rewards, right? So if I set it to zero, it's very easy to see that all of these future terms, they'll go away. And the only thing I'm left with is this, right? So having a zero basically says, I don't care, give me the cookie or give me the dessert right away. I don't care whether I have to pay for it later, right? So it's a nearsighted evaluation measure, okay? That only favors the immediate rewards that I get at the next time step. Okay, and on the other hand, if you set these all to one, of course, then um, you, you have all of these gammas go away. And then it was simply, we have all of the summation of all of the rewards, right? So that's a particularly far-sighted evaluation because then you're basically saying, you know, I, I don't care whether I get the reward now, whether I get it five years from now, or, you know, close to death, I still am going to value it the same way, okay? So um, that's uh, when we don't have any trade-off between time. Okay, and usually we want to set this gamma factor, this discount factor in some way that allows a balance between them. Okay, it's a hyperparameter that in your learning agent you get to decide. Okay, so you might be asking why, why would we discount anyways? Well, there are a number of different reasons. One is that uh, for us as uh, mathematicians and computer scientists, it's much easier to work with uh, something that allows a, a nice smooth uh, version uh, smooth is the key word in all of the course, right? Because when we have smooth, we can calculate a gradient. Uh, it can be twice differentiable, and then we can optimize, right? We can use an optimizer that we would get from SGD or something like that to do that, okay? And when we discount, that means that, you know, in the limit, we get a stationary value. So we don't have to worry about having infinite rewards, right? There might be cycles or states that can happen in my graph. And um, in this way, I can avoid cases where I can just keep on doing the problem forever and continue to get more rewards, right? And uh, there's also these other problems, right? So it's in many cases that there's uncertainty about the future. And uh, in the real world, if you get an immediate reward, you can invest that to earn more rewards, right? So um, it's always preferred in the financial sense to get an immediate reward of the same value so that you can invest that um, you know, value into a, a bank or something and get more returns from it, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna talk about this at all, but you can think about this case. If you have an undiscounted reward process, that means when you set uh, um, gamma equals to one, so we don't have uh, any penalty to that, um, then we can uh, still use our Markov reward process um, in the only case where all of the sequences terminate. That means I, I can always get to an end of the episode. I never have a cycle. Okay. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I talked about it anyways, okay. All right, so uh, we come to the idea of uh, the value function, right? So we said, okay, what we want to do with a value function Vs is to give some idea of the long-term value, okay? So when we think about a reward process, okay, not an MVP, okay, a reward process that only has rewards for leaving a state. So I get into a state, I am going to have to leave it, okay? Even if it's a self-loop, I enter it back again. But being in that state allows me to uh, take an action. After I take that uh, action or something happens to me, okay? Then I end up with some value, okay? It could be a negative value or whatever, but it's basically the expected return from starting at that state, right? So this is our, our G function. This is our return that we talked about earlier, right? Which is, um, uh, recursive function definition because we're looking at um, all of the, the future time points as well. Okay, oops. All right, and uh, again, for policies, it's very uh, similar, right? So the policy is the distribution over actions given states. So here, when we're thinking about policies, of course, it doesn't apply to MRPs. It only applies to MVPs because policies mean we have actions, right? So a policy is the distribution of actions over given states. So you have a state. Uh, I say, what action am I going to take? Okay, and that dictates my policy. This says that I'm action, I'm in state S. I know what action I'm going to do, okay, A, with some probability. It could be deterministic means that all of the actions have a uh, probability for, of zero, except for one action, which is the optimal action that I'm going to take, okay? So an MVP policy, uh, uh, as we said, depends on the current state. We've already taken all the history and represented it in the current time step, ST, 
right? So we can say that they're really basically time independent. If I find myself in the exact same state, I should always choose the same action, okay? Because if it was time dependent, well, that means I'm not in the same state, right? Somehow the state is different, okay? There's some penalty for being in the state because the, the time variable has actually been indicated as a part of that. And so I could say being here at four o'clock and being here at five o'clock and being here at six o'clock are three different states. They're not the same state, okay? And that's why we can say that the policies are stationary over time. Okay, so that's a very important distinction, right? If you need to get to the airport, assuming you, you could travel, right? And your plane leaves at five o'clock, um, knowing that it's four o'clock or three o'clock or um, 450 would very much have a different type of action that you want to associate it. So then we would say in the MDP case, these are not the same state, even if you're in the same location because the time variable is different. Okay, so this is the formula that I think uh, you asked, one of you asked on, on, the, um, on the chat, okay, basically to say that um, what action I'm going to take at a certain state is going to be always the same. It's not going to vary, okay, with a state, okay. It's uh, going to be a stationary uh, distribution because otherwise I'm just going to say that my state encoding doesn't have all the information. I need to reflect other information such as time and put that within the state as well, okay? All right, now when we change from value functions of an MRP to value functions of an MDP, now we have two possibilities. We can say exactly like the MRP, equivalent to the MRP, okay? we have this idea of a state value function, right? It's basically the same thing, right? This is the expected of return for being in a particular state, okay? And uh, this has to be indexed on a policy, right? The policy tells us what to do. So even if you're in the same state, but you have a different preference or, or idea about what to do, then of course the value for doing that would be different, okay? So that's why you always see the V subscripted with policy, okay? So it says here, basically, what is the expected return, okay? The GT is, again, it's like the R, but it's pushing all the summations of R together, right? So I have all this Rs from uh, T equals one to infinity here, right? Um, and I'm looking at the expected value, right? The expected value just says, okay, if I am looking at this and I look at all the possible things that I could do, and all the possible states that I, uh, I can be, what's the most likely, what's the expected value uh, of being in the state right now, okay? Now, we can also think of, because in an, MR, in an MDP, we have something special, right? In the MDP, we have actions. So we can also think about one step farther down the line, which is to say, not only are we gonna talk about the state, let's also condition on the action, right? So I'm gonna say, what action did I take in the state? You know, if I take the left door, if I take the right door, if I buy, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a ticket or if I decide to skip the concert, okay, all of these different things might have different rewards attached to them. So we're going to say that the action value function or quality score, this is what Q stands for, is also conditioned on the policy and then uh, takes this information into account. So it's the same formulation, it's just that we have this extra condition, right? To say, which action did we take? Okay, so when we take a look at the state value function, again, we can try to regress this, uh, not regress it, to try to estimate this or calculate it exactly. It basically uh, means that we have to uh, go through the equation of calculating the returns and then the uh, first the rewards and then back calculate all of the return values. So I had to take this plus 10 and then uh, put this 10 here okay, for the uh, v pi for this particular state. But then after I execute this a few more times, I'll notice the score goes down, right? Because sometimes um, I will have to go uh, through something like this, okay, this triangle over here, and then I would have incurred uh, a total cost of minus one, okay, to reach the same state, okay? Because the states are time independent, then uh, being in this state sometimes will mean that uh, I'm going to go take the study arc, 
sometimes it means I'll go clubbing and end up uh, doing this triangle or, or, or another route, right? And another possible way of going through this is to say, uh, you know, I got to the state, I went clubbing, I uh, had to pay the penalty of going back to class one, uh, then going to class two, and then doing this a couple times before uh, ending up here, okay? So all of these are being uh, put together to uh, find uh, at the optimal point, right, after I've done, done enough iterations and things don't change, then I have the state value function of a 7.4, okay? So this case, uh, as we said before, is indexed on a particular um, policy, right? I have to have a policy to decide what to do, right? Here we have a particular brain dead policy of being uh, uniform, right? Any action that I have has equal probability. So, uh, you, you know, even at this point where the stakes are pretty high, uh, I might decide 50-50 to go clubbing or to study. Okay, so the idea of finding a good policy is really simple, right? What we want to do is decide what is the right policy to take? We want to make our actions worthwhile and try to drive them so that we get the best value for them, okay? But, you know, we don't know what the best value for them is because we don't even know in certain cases what actions generate what rewards, okay? So what we want to do is uh, do these two things interchangeably, right? We're going to start with perhaps a random uh, value function, okay? State value function, action value function, okay? And then um, a policy, perhaps uniform, like we saw on the last slide, and then, you know, try to use these in some ways to get better results. So the one thing we might do is say, given a policy, can I optimize what's the actual value for this policy, okay? So if I'm in a particular state and I take a particular action, um, can I know the actual value of being in that state under this particular policy? If I have that very well down, okay, then I can say, oh, I'm gonna reverse engineer. How could I get to the states that have the best value, okay? And by doing that, I am going to come up with a greedy policy okay, that's trying to optimize getting the best values, okay, but those values are conditioned on the actual policy that I had at the beginning, right, this one down here. So when I uh, have re-optimized my policy, then my policy uh, estimations of V are incorrect because uh, this, uh, this, uh, sorry, this pi is not the same pi as before, you know, it's pi one instead of pi naught, okay. So this is the whole idea of solving uh, a policy and a value interchangeably. Okay, to do that, we're going to get to this idea of a recursive definition through the idea of a Bellman equation, okay? So a Bellman equation is really simple, okay? Um, it's basically saying that uh, we are going to chop up these uh, expectations into two parts, okay? The one that comes immediate as well as the one that's recursively defined. Okay, so uh, we can say, for example, all right, the state value function and the action value function, these two pieces of information, is just the current, uh, the, f the immediate future reward that happens at the next time step, as well as uh, some other information, right? And this other information is basically what happens at the next time step, right? So if I knew what this value was, okay, this uh, V pi of the next state, right, let's say I have this magically, okay, then all I have to do is get that value in this uh, top uh, rectangle, right, add it to my immediate rewards for being in this time step, okay, Take, taking this uh, action or, or being in this state uh, in the case of the top one here, okay, and then I have the expected amount of rewards uh, that I would have or return that I would have being in this state or taking a particular action. Okay, so you can see where we're going with this, right? Because you can see that there is some recursion, right? There's a, um, a Q pi, a Q pi, a V pi, and a V pi, okay? Okay, in terms of uh, thinking of it pictorially, it looks a little bit like this. So these are called uh, Bellman backup uh, diagrams, okay? Basically, we have an action, uh, so, sorry, we have a state, Okay, we might be in a particular state here and I want to find this value, right? Which is uh, what's the value of being in the state given the current policy pi, 
okay? And I have a number of actions that I can take. So I'm gonna enumerate all of them and say for each one of them, the Q is related to the V, right? Because uh, once I have the uh, A, then I can say, okay, what is the action? Uh, what's the value of taking that action under that current state? Okay. So uh, we can calculate the value functions by recursing through one step, right? So we're, we're thinking, okay, if I'm at the front of the problem at the beginning, let's say class session one, I'm gonna go uh, think about what it means to do Instagram or what it means to study class session two. And if in order to decide that, I have to go one step forward, farther, right? Um, to go clubbing or um, go to class session three, okay? So you can see where we're ending up is that we have to think much farther in the future because we have to finish the uh, understanding or the estimates of what it's close, what these values are close to the determination of an episode, let's say at the goal state or when the agent dies, okay, in order for us to estimate how, how well I'm doing currently now, okay? So uh, the way we can think about this is really simple. We're gonna just say, why don't we add together all of the values of the Q functions, but uh, condition it on, uh, you know, what action I'm supposed to take. The policy tells us, again, the probability that I take one or more of these different actions, right? So I have A, A2, A3, A4, okay, all the way to AN here, okay, uh, indexed by my policy. So this, this block tell me, uh, basically tells me what, what, what likelihood am I going to take all of these actions for, okay? I'm gonna sum them up together, and that is going to be the value of uh, being in this state. Okay, of course we can reverse it the other way around, right? If you think of it starting from an action, okay? Let's say I decide to study for the test, okay? And then the environment is going to react in a certain way and I may get a reward that I want. I may not, you know, it's stochastic. We don't know exactly unless we have a fully observable environment, right? So in this case, what we get is uh, something like this. We're gonna say, well, I could have ended up in S prime but I could have ended up in any number of these other states that I didn't indicate here, okay? With some probability, okay? I don't know, uh, but it's going to happen through the probability transition matrix, okay? It's gonna say, given that I was in state S and I took action A, what's the likelihood I ended up at S prime or any one of these other states, right? Double, double S prime or triple S prime, et cetera, okay? So that's the idea there, okay? And of course, we have to think about the discount factor, right? The fact that we get a reward, which is uh, what we're going to observe when we go through this arc, okay? That's associated with the actual um, uh, reward for taking that action, okay? But then we also have to think about the future rewards, okay? I'm now in a new state. I, I'm going to get rewards for being in the state when I take another action out. So that's going to be conditioned on, on what's going to happen in the future, okay? And we're going to take the rest of the tree from down here out and multiply it by uh, successive uh, amounts of gamma as we go farther down into the recursion, okay? And that's uh, given here, okay? So uh, it, it doesn't have a, a multiplicative factor because it's already inside of here, okay? Just to make that clear, okay? So you had the top half, now we had the bottom half, and stick these two trees together. And then we have something like this, right? To say that I want to go from a state variable to uh, the next state, I have to go through which actions the agent might take and then uh, which uh, rewards might the environment give me and which states uh, I might end up given that I took that action and observed a certain reward, okay? So that's the idea there. So we get all of this together and uh, we end up with a, a diagram like this, okay? So here are our Q functions, our, our quality estimates, which is this intermediate layer, okay? Which is just uh, abstracting away everything underneath here, okay? And the policy, all right? Which is, uh, again, a distribution of uh, actions that we might want to take is uh, what we see at this level, right? Basically choosing among all of these different A actions that we can do. Of course, when we have an optimal policy, okay, and we know exactly what we, uh, the environment looks like, then all of these A's will be zero except for one, right? Whatever the optimal action will be, that's the only action that we're going to take, 
Okay, but uh, you know, in the general formulation, we can say that the policy is just a, a distribution. Okay, not particularly peaked. Okay, we can flip it the other way around, right? So we have the same idea for uh, Q, right? So the Q is saying um, going from a particular action, how do I value that in terms of subsequent actions, right? So we have the same recursive formula, formalization here. Okay, so we have a double summation here because we need to think about the uh, value uh, of the actual states. And then we have a, a state transition uh, matrix that tells us which state we're going to end up in. So that's basically deciding which of these arcs that I'm doing, given I took action A, right? So this decision point here is not up to me. This is uh, the responsibility of the environment. So the environment is going to react to uh, my action Right? And it's going to output uh, one of these uh, particular probabilities. Okay, so I don't know why that didn't uh, come in very well. Can you guys hear me? Give me a second and let me just uh, restart there. Just uh, top two. Okay, so I was talking about this case uh, where we had um, this recursive formulation, right? And uh, the, two, the two double summations that we have, right? So just to make it clear, this is the, the value function that we have, okay? Which corresponds to everything from here on down. So these two are equivalent, okay? And we have this summation over here, which is based on the probability transition matrix, which basically decides which of these possible outcomes could happen when I take the action A, right? Because here it's the environment, the environment that reacts, not me, okay? So the environment decides what is the outcome of taking action A. I end up at any one of the states down here, okay? And then I have the values for each of these states as a part of this term. Okay, so now we have a, a nice formulation of uh, what we're doing. Okay, and we can add all of this information into uh, the Bellman expectation, right? So we can calculate all of these and decide uh, how much is it worth to be in a particular state, how much a particular action is worth uh, coming out of the state. So again, under the same uniform policy here, then I can see uh, what happens, right? If I end up uh, under the uniform policy deciding to study, um, then I get this uh, plus 10 arc here. I'll end up uh, over here at the terminal state. Otherwise, I might end up either uh, back in the same place with the same utility or um, in something worse, right? Any one of these, okay? So this is then uh, a system of linear equations that we're trying to uh, estimate for the value of a, a policy, okay? For both the state value function as well as the um, other parts. Okay, so we, we can try to calculate this uh, and uh, we'll get the values that uh, we get. Okay, uh, this is in the case where we have iterated a number of times because here you can see there's a recursive part. You know, this 7.4 is uh, basically what we're trying to calculate. And uh, you would only get that value after recursing enough times and observing some stationary, um, uh, no change. Okay, okay, uh, there is a chat, so let's take a look at what that said. Okay. All right, yeah, sorry about that, it froze. Uh, so hopefully uh, now it's working all right. So if it's not just uh, raise uh, that through chat again, okay? Okay, great. So um, basically, okay, this is a, a little bit hard to understand. Basically what we were basic saying is that those types of equations that we've seen on the last slides, okay? They basically can be expressed in a uh, linear set of equations. Again, we have a linear algebra system, then we can compute this, all right? So we're basically saying that uh, I have an equation for a particular state, you know, V of being in S well, under a particular policy, but I'm not looking at one S, I'm looking at all possible S's, okay? All of these, and I'm folding that into a, uh, a matrix form. Okay, so uh, you, you saw this when we went through SGD and other things. Okay, so you're, you put your, your linear algebra hat on if you can. Okay, so we have this uh, column vector of values that I'm trying to estimate, my state value functions for a particular state. Okay, 
for all states uh, S1 through S, uh, all of the possible states, right? Um, that is in here. And I'm going to encode it very simply as um, the reward function, right? So that's again, conditioned on the policy as well as the transition matrix and then recursively looking at this column vector again. Okay, so when we multiply these two things together and add them after uh, accounting for the discount, then I have a series of simultaneous equations that I can solve, okay? If I put this through a solver, then I'll get the direct solution. So this actually has an algebraic solution, okay? It's just the identity matrix um, with the discount value times the probability uh, matrix, okay? You take the inverse of that and you multiply it uh, against the reward uh, function, okay? That, that is the actual solution. You can actually, we don't usually do this, right? We, we usually actually have to iterate it out, okay? Uh, in order to deal with cycles, okay? So we can find the direct solution uh, when there are no cycles, okay? So don't worry if you don't get your head around this, this is just uh, to say there is basically um, the formulation of an MRP or uh, uh, MDP into a set of simultaneous linear equations, okay? The simultaneity comes from the fact that we want to solve these uh, value, state value functions or action value functions for all states or for all state action pairs simultaneously, okay? So when we solve them all simultaneously, we basically have our policy or have our value function. Okay, so what do we want to do now is that say, okay, now we have that, okay, so I'm going to pause there for a second and make sure we're, we're all aboard, uh, making sure that um, all of you got um, something out of what I talked about over the last hour. So uh, anyone uh, have concerns or would like to put something on the, the poll everywhere, then we can take a look at that, okay. So uh, here we have uh, another question, so let's go uh, take a look at this one. Okay, so um, for the same policy, shouldn't Q of S A and V of S be the same? Okay, um, that's a good question. Okay, if I am taking, I'm in a state and I take a different action, okay, is it going to lead me to a different reward? Okay, so definitely the Q values would be different for a state. When we try to evaluate what the state should be, Okay, then of course we want to take the state value that's the same as the best Q value, right? Because obviously uh, if we're an agent, we would say, um, I'm going to make a decision, whatever this A is, right? And if I'm gonna take an A, I might as well to take the one that's going to lead me to the best possible decision. So if I back this up one step, right? If I say from this Q, I can go back and get a V, obviously I'm gonna value my V for whatever the, the action was the best. So out of all of these actions here that I could take A1 through AN, okay, I would say take the max, right? This is what I want to do. Take the maximum value and then value that as my V, okay? So I hope that answers your question. So we'll come to that in a second when we're trying to actually optimize and say what it is, okay? Now, it's not the case in the MDP and the MRP that we actually are saying that we're doing a maximum yet, okay? This is to solve it, but in just the characterization, we're just going to say that there is this probability matrix, right? From S to S prime given A, okay? And when we have optimized it, that means that our A is actually going to set uh, to a particular value and all of the other probabilities to take a different action and arrive at a different state will be all set to zero, okay? So that's the idea. So I hope that answers your uh, question about whether um, Q, our Q quality function and our value function are the same, okay? Okay, so we also answered this question about the M MDP MRP, okay? Yeah, we, we talked about this count. And I think we covered all these other equations so far. So uh, we'll continue a little bit more on our lecture. Everyone good with that so far? Anyone wanna give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a yes or no? Everyone all right? Okay, at least a couple people are still here. <laughs> That's good. I appreciate the feedback. Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen.
Okay, how do we calculate the V of C1 for the slide covering Bellman expectation for student MDP? Okay, so we're going to get to actually how to calculate these when we get to Q learning and uh, the planning algorithm called uh, value iteration. Okay, so just hold on there for a second, just to say that it's not that easy because what we want to do is iteratively calculate them. Okay, there is a closed form that we showed you on the last slide with the linear set of equations, but we typically don't do that. Okay, so we typically just do it from an iterative standpoint and uh, we'll see how that works. Okay, so I, I will try to cover this in um, roughly 10 minutes from now. <laughs> okay, just hold on and, and we'll hopefully we'll get there. Okay, thanks for that. That's a, a good seg into the next part. Okay, so we're, we're going to make it not so rosy first, and then we're going to show one, one good way of, of dealing with it. So like we saw on the last, uh, that, that purple slide there, right, where, where you guys ask questions, right? When we want to equate uh, uh, things that are uh, in our state values and our Q values, and we want to say these are actually the same, you know, we basically want to say that you know, our agent is going to make an optimal decision, right? And when we make a policy, we want to take the optimal policy or the best possible. So it's always going to be, in the case of positive rewards, a maximum, okay? So instead of being kiasu and thinking about penalties, now we're thinking about rewards. So uh, reinforcement learning is somehow optimistic. You know, training uh, classifiers is sort of pessimistic, okay? So in this case, we have a maximum function, right, to say that, um, the uh, optimal state value function as denoted by the star is just going to be the optimal function over all policies, okay? So I'm gonna go through every single policy that I could think of, okay? Look at what that each of those policies thought about this state S, okay? And then pick the one that has the maximal value for it. And that's going to be the optimal state value function for that particular state, okay? So uh, what does that help us with? Well, we'll see in a while, okay? And we can make the same type of definition for the action value function, right? So I'm gonna say uh, for this particular state and action pair, go through all the policies under the sun that you have, okay? Uh, with different state transition probabilities, et cetera. And then uh, pick the one that has the maximum value for this Q, okay? And we're gonna call that the optimal uh, action value function, okay? So, what can we say about that? Those definitely specify the best possible performance in an MDP, okay? So when we have these optimal value functions, we can say that we've actually solved the problem. We know what we're going to do because at this particular uh, uh, state action, uh, uh, sorry, at this particular state or this particular uh, state action pair, this is the one that's going to cause me to get the maximal reward, okay? So uh, when I iterate enough times, okay, I might be able to find the op optimal value function. So this is in the case where I have no discount, okay? I basically re uh, think about the rewards for everything uh, as being the same, okay? So there's a plus 10 reward for being here, right? And then, uh, you know, I wouldn't ever go uh, in the opposite directions and I would end up with eight and six and six here because I would never take this transition statement, right? Because if I do that, there's a cost. So the best possible thing for me to do is go directly through this line and finish, okay? And if I accidentally end up here, well, um, you know, because there's no cost for studying here, then uh, I would get the six again, okay? So that's the idea behind having the optimal value function, okay? So you want to know how to calculate that, we'll get to it, but this is just an uh, example of, of how we, what, what it would look like. Okay, so um, in order to do that, we're going to say, maybe we can compare policies against each other, okay? So we're gonna define a partial ordering of policies, just like sort of we did in the um, concept learning idea, right? We're gonna look at a hypothesis and say whether or not a hypothesis is more general or specific than this. We're gonna do a partial ordering of policies, okay? So we're gonna say that a policy is uh, somehow better than another policy, okay, or uh, ordered over another policy, if we know that uh, for all states, okay, the value function for one policy is always better or equal than a value function for another policy, okay? So um, under that, I can define a partial order. It's not a full uh, ordering because of this, you know, it doesn't say for all, you know, for every, uh, any state, it says for all states, okay, then I can sort of uh, define an ordering over this, 
okay? So there's a theorem that we're not going to prove, okay? It's not, uh, it's not hard to prove, but it's, um, you know, takes longer than we have, okay? To say that there is always some type of optimal policy that is going to always be better or equal to all other policies, okay? There could be cases where there are multiple optimal policies. You can think about uh, in the case of going left, right, a couple more times it won't damage you, okay? So then you, you might get the same score at the end of the game, okay? So all optimal policies must, of course, uh, achieve the optimal value function. And uh, in order to get to that value function, they must have taken the optimal action as well, okay? So the, those are nice things that we can understand from having the, this conceptual idea of the optimal policy, okay? Okay, so we wanna know how to find that optimal policy. Well, we said before, we want to make it a, not a probability distribution. It needs to be very clear what we should do at a state, right? Uh, if by taking a particular action, I end up in uh, maximizing uh, and uh, getting this Q star, you know, get the same action uh, value uh, that we would have over all possible actions, then I'm going to set my policy to only use that, right? So this probability is now unity, okay? Every other action that I could have do, I'm no longer going to think about doing it at all, okay? So this is now a deterministic policy. This is a stationary policy that says for every state, for every action, I know exactly what I'm going to do, right? So this then follows that as soon as I know the optimal action value function, then we already know the optimal policy, right? It's always to follow whatever was in this state and to follow the action that gave me this result, okay? So this is sort of like bending about the bush, but we get the idea, right? In order to find the optimal policy, we need the optimal Q function. And um, once we have that, we, we're all set, okay? So we can see how this is going to line up. If we have the, the correct Q function, which is the same for uh, what we saw before, uh, we, we are going to get uh, the same values, right? So uh, you can see it all here, okay? So you can see some differences. Uh, in, in this case, we have a Q uh, value, uh, optimal value function, action value function for uh, going clubbing, which is uh, worse than going to study. Uh, of course, you can see that here. And then uh, you have uh, some differences between the uh, optimal state value function and the uh, action value function in, in these cases over here, okay? Again, I'm not showing you how to calculate that yet. I'm just showing you what the end result of this uh, system is. Okay. So um, now we're going to the optimality part, okay? So we're going to revisit the optimality equations, okay? And we're just going to notice that uh, out of all of the possible actions that I could take, I basically choose the one that maximizes it. So this goes back to the question that you guys asked on the Ask Me Anything, right? Is this case the same as this? Yes, in the case where we choose the action that has the maximal value, okay? For Q, it's gonna be similarly defined, right? We had this recursive definition, but in the case of uh, defining its uh, Q values with relationships to V, there is no maximum, right? Because here, I've already decided what action I'm taking. The agent gets to decide A, but you know, where I end up is not my business, okay? That is the function of the environment, okay? So there's no max value here. You can see it's just a, a, a linear set of equations. Okay, all right. So when we recurse through both uh, V star or Q star, you'll notice that both of them have a max term, right? There's a max term here. And if we go back one slide for a second, there is a max term over here, okay? So those are all, the both of the maxes are because the agent is trying to do something that maximizes its utility or return, okay? Which is basically the, the sum discounted rewards that it gets over all of the time steps, okay? So uh, we understand that, okay? Um, so when we do this uh, type of calculation, basically if I want to decide what is the optimum value function, like you asked, okay? How do I solve this, right? Well, let's say I have everything else, then I can solve this one, right? I can say, um, well, I, I've got to choose between two different things, okay? I could either go this route, okay? Okay, 
and uh, incur a minus two penalty, but end up in a state which is valued at uh, a, a reward of eight. Okay, so that's this block here. Or, you know, I could do the opposite thing. I could decide from here. The other thing that I could do is this part, right? So I could incur a cost of one, so it's less taxing to do Instagram uh, and end up with a reward uh, in a state that has the uh, reward of six. Okay, so that's that part over here. So I'm doing this maximum function, which is basically looking at the recursion of the, the um, formula that we saw before for one step, right? Because what we said is there's an immediate part, right? And um, a future part. And the future part, we're going to have to establish, right? Because I will actually have to solve uh, V star for C2 in order to get that. And uh, V star for Instagram, right? For, for that one. Okay, so here's the bad news, okay? Now, when we were talking about um, MRPs, okay, and MCs, okay, Markov chains, when we have the transitions, those are completely uh, linear because we have a set of distributions and we can just uh, multiply them through. Okay, so there's a set of uh, simultaneous linear equations that we can optimize or, or solve. But as soon as we get a nonlinearity, okay, the nonlinearity here is the max, right? Uh, it's, it doesn't have a gradient, and you can't really uh, take a, a differential of that, okay? We are stuck because we can't actually go through all of the different maxes and solve this, okay? So we don't have a nice closed form solution that we showed for the case of the multiple simultaneous equations for a Markov uh, reward process, okay? As soon as we have actions and those actions are going to be maximized, okay? Then the MVP doesn't have a closed solution, okay? So we actually have to do something else. We have to go back and say, well, there's no normal equation or a closed form uh, solution. We have to do iteration. Okay, so we're gonna come to the first uh, idea, which is, uh, again, going, harking back to that slide where I said we start with a policy Okay, I'll just uh, zoom down for it for a second. Something like this, where we have a policy, okay, and we have an estimation of the value of the states, and we're gonna recursively bounce back and forth to decide what to do, okay? So we'll uh, get there in a couple minutes, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is say, if I have a policy, can I know how good that policy is? Okay, yeah. Well, why do we wanna do that? Because I want to know how good a policy is, if I know two policies and I can evaluate both, then I can do that partial ordering type of thing, right? Which is to say that, can I um, you know, discard, make obsolete one policy over one that's better, okay? So if I can see that all of the uh, V pi S's are better than or equal to another V pi S, sorry, let me get rid of that one, okay? V pi prime of S, Right? Then I would say, uh, you know, this policy is no good. Whatever uh, V prime was, that's not as good as what I have now. So let's stick with what I have now, okay? And so uh, I can actually solve this fairly easily just by doing the iteration because there's no max term, right? There's no maximum term here. So this is just a set of linear equations, right? I have the future rewards, uh, the reward at the particular time step, uh, a probability distribution here, I have the current policy to tell me which actions I'm going to take. And I just sum through all of these and then I'll get the, the value function I have for this particular state given the current policy. Okay. And uh, we're going to recursively do that, right? So this is actually what we would do. All right. We would say we have an MDP. Okay. The MDP has all of our states. It has our transition model okay, which is how the environment reacts. We have a reward function that tells us what rewards we get when we take a certain action from a state. We have a discount variable, okay, and the policy that we're trying to evaluate, okay. Once we have all of those, what we want to do is get our a state value function, our V, right? So we're gonna say, well, we don't know any better. We're gonna say them all at zero first and then estimate them, okay? And then we're gonna say, uh, stop estimating this when there's fairly little change in any state. Okay, when all the values in our V vector for all the state values are pretty stationary, 
okay? That's what this part down here means, okay? So uh, when we have less than an epsilon amount of change, then we terminate from this loop. Otherwise, we're gonna do this forever, okay? Which is basically say, I'm gonna reset the amount of change to zero. And then for every state that I have, I'm just going to go do this. I'm gonna take the uh, current uh, value of the, uh, the, the state, okay? Put it in a variable then uh, re-estimate what it means for the current state's uh, value, right? So this is all, all the same equation that you saw on the last slide, okay? I'm going to basically look up how much it is to be in a, uh, the next particular state, discount it, multiply it upon the discount, add the current reward, estimate, okay, this is an estimated amount right now, okay? Times it through the probability matrix, uh, transition matrix, and then conditioned on the policy, sum all of this together, and this is my new, my new value of uh, Vs, okay? And then if the Vs changed by a lot compared to this old value, okay, and the new value, then I say, uh-oh, um, you know, the, the, my policy evaluation changed. Some, some, some vector, uh, one, one, one state in my vector of Vs has changed enough that I'm not done yet. Okay, so I have to do it again, okay? So that's where we're going with it, okay? You can see what will happen is that we start from, let's say a final state, which has a plus 10 reward, right? And our initial states are like, uh, like this, okay, a chain, okay? At the beginning, in order to estimate this state, I'll use this information here. But this information is initially zero too, okay? So when I calculate this, this, uh, this state's information, it will get a zero. Okay, the only state that actually gets updated in the first iteration is the one close to the end, right? Because I'm gonna propagate this plus 10, which I know from the final state down, okay? The one's closest to the ending of the episode, okay? So I have to recurse, 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 recurse until everything gets filled in, okay? So that's the idea of policy evaluation, okay? Once we have that and we're satisfied that all of our Vs are pretty much not changing anymore, okay? Then we can say, well, you know, I've done a pretty good estimate of how good this policy is. I'm gonna return you my value function. The value function is again, just this vector of um, information. Okay, so great. We evaluate a policy. Um, what we wanna do is, uh, you know, make a policy building. So what can we do? We can say, you know that that pi of uh, a given s, what happens if we change it, right? Maybe instead of taking action a1, I take action a2 and it results in something better, okay? Then I need to change my policy, right? So I'm gonna look around and um, try to figure out for every state, is there a possible action that is going to make the current policy better? I'm gonna do it simultaneously. I'm not doing it for a particular state. And when I do policy improvement, I'm gonna consider all possible states, all possible actions and say, is there something incrementally I could do better than what I have under the current policy, okay? So I'm gonna select the state that the action appears the best according to the uh, Q value, my quality function estimates for the particular policy that I have now, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. So um, this is then what we call policy iteration, okay? Policy iteration is just as it sounds, okay? It says, find a better policy each time. But the problem is we have this inner loop. In order to know whether a policy is any good, we have to evaluate it first. How do we evaluate it? By getting the optimal state value function for that policy, okay? So there's an inner loop here that basically has to repeat forever until the policy evaluation is stable. Okay, once the policy uh, uh, evaluation is stable, I know how to evaluate this policy. Then I ask myself my outer loop, is there any state where the action that I could do could actually be better than what I could do now? Okay, so that's what this thing is here, right? This is the argmax, right? That says, let's see whether we can make it bigger. Mm, I don't think so, not in slide share mode. Okay, um, that uh, we want to be able to take the current estimates of the states, uh, the reward factors, and uh, the probability uh, uh, transition matrix, and then calculate the current value of the policy, right? Okay, so it looks the same as the policy evaluation because here we're just looking at whether or not uh, 
the policy is stable, okay? If in fact I've changed the right thing to do at any particular state, okay, then I, I need to reevaluate my policy, you know, because you know, when I take a different action, I have a different uh, distribution of actions that I'm doing. That means my, uh, my value for the policies have changed because it's a different policy. Okay, so this is the uh, general idea that we saw, right? We're going to do policy evaluation first. This is this part. We do the evaluation, right? Then after the evaluation, we look around and say, for every state, is there a better action I can take? I do the improvement. Then after I do the improvement, I have to go back and say, okay, now I have a whole different set of actions that I'm doing per, per, per uh, state. I better go figure out whether those, um, what, what's the value for that, right? So I'm gonna evaluate the policy and then I'm gonna do the same thing. So I'm gonna bounce, 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 bounce until basically both of these things are stationary and I will have ended up with the optimal value function but also the optimal policy, they, they go hand in hand, okay? But a really nifty trick, okay, is that we don't actually care about this thing up here, okay? It, it would be fine if you were really sloppy in your evaluation or your estimate, as long as you make sure your agent does the right thing, okay? If your agent does the right thing, who cares how bad your estimate is, okay? So what we really, really want is only this piece of information. We want our pi star, okay? So in fact, you can think about it. If I change my policy a little bit, do I really need to go through this entire process of making sure my evaluation of the policy is exactly right? Maybe not, okay? So what we're going to do is just one step of uh, uh, po uh, policy evaluation, okay? I'm not gonna do it to convergence, okay? So if I go back here, okay, this part here, I'm not gonna do this loop forever, okay? This repeat part, okay? Actually, I'm not gonna do that, okay? I'm just gonna do it one time, okay? I'm gonna do evaluation policy once, okay? And then say, okay, my estimates are updated. They're not, they're not perfect, but it's a, little, it's a little bit better. And then I'm gonna ask myself again, can I do policy improvement, okay? And that is the idea of uh, value iteration, okay? So value iteration is very simple. Okay. In policy iteration, as we saw before, the problem was that inner loop is expensive, right? Every time your value of a particular state changes, they say, oh gosh, we've got to do it all over again. Okay, so you have to throw everything out the window and then uh, uh, reevaluate how good that uh, V function is. Okay, so it could be quite protracted. Okay, so what we want to do is that is say, calculate the returns of each state and then use those state returns to find the optimal policy. Okay, so uh, if you're not sure what that means, let's get to it and uh, we'll show you what it means, okay? So value iteration is almost identical to the other algorithms that we saw, okay? Again, we have the same MDP, we have the same error, okay? And we have the same value function that we're trying to estimate. But here, we don't want to evaluate a particular policy. You notice that there are no policies on this slide at all, right? No policy, okay, so what are we doing? We're trying to evaluate what is the optimal value function, okay? We're just gonna to continue to iterate, iterate, iterate over the value function until we get the best possible value function from it, okay? And we want to return this V star, okay? So how do we do that? Okay, we start with any old value function, who cares, all right? All right, so we are gonna start with uh, uh, all initially zero, okay? And then uh, we're going to do this step, which says uh, take down a local copy of these zeros, okay? Assign a new uh, state value estimate based on doing the maximum, okay? So I'm gonna take a look at all of the possible ways that I could get out of this state and then see what's the maximum value I could get given that I have the immediate rewards and the future rewards as dictated here, okay? And then if this maximum was over some threshold, then I'm going to say it changed enough. And then I have to repeat this process. Okay, so that's it. Okay, 
After this, I keep on doing this in a loop. Again, the key part is here because I'm not evaluating for a policy. I'm just saying in the best of all possible worlds, if I'm in a certain state and I can go to all of these other states with these immediate rewards and these future rewards, which one is the one that's gonna maximize it, okay? And assign that to the V of S, okay? So after I do this enough times, I actually get the optimal value function. Wait, Min, didn't you just say, I don't care about the value function. I want the optimal policy. So why are we doing value iteration in the first place? Isn't that sort of stupid? The answer is no, okay? Definitely not. Because with the optimal value function, we have one step just to find out the policy, okay? That's easy, very easy, right? I'm gonna choose the policy that's going to give me this V function in the first place, right? Just choose the action from a state that results in having this value for the next state, right? So we are just using the Bellman uh, uh, diagram and stepping back one, or backing up one uh, iteration saying, okay, if the best value function was this, what was that magical action that caused me to get this V star, okay? That will be the right action to take. Everything else is no good, okay? So that's what we can do. So, um, you know, that is one way that we can solve the MDP problem, okay? The problem here is it is solving an MDP, okay? Not doing learning, okay? Why? Because when we're doing reinforcement learning, as we saw in the game uh, example, we are actually missing two really important pieces of information, okay? What are they? They're we don't know exactly what rewards that we're going to get, okay? We're, we're an agent, we get plopped down like a vacuum cleaner. We're going around, we don't know whether we're doing a good job or not. So, um, you know, if our owner doesn't throw us in the trash bin or we clean enough or we don't use enough battery, then we can observe rewards. But uh, initially we don't have a model for that, okay? And then we also don't know what state we're going to be. You can imagine you're the Mars rover, you plop down in a new uh, part of the planet and you have to observe the environment you have no connection to uh, the Earth or Houston, and you have to decide what to do, okay? So you have to uh, decide what to do, what actions are you gonna take, and uh, you, you get to observe only as things go on, whether you end up in a new state or you get a new reward, okay? So we have to actually infer the rewards and the state transitions as we're going along, okay? So uh, earlier we said we were going to do all of this through this Markov decision process, right? So once we have this information about um, given the current state and action, what is the best next state and reward as specified particularly by these two parts here, okay? Knowing what transition we can make and what's the likelihood of ending up in a new state and what rewards we're gonna get given a particular action or state, then we have a fully specified MDP, okay? So when we have that, we can just, you know, sit and cogitate ourselves, you know, just sit down and say, okay, well, next semester is gonna be really rough because I've got so many different modules and how am I gonna plan it out? So I have an idea about what, what things can happen, okay? So this is called planning, right? We are given a fully specified MDP, which has in particular these two variables, okay? And then we can compute the optimal policy. There is a way to simulate it, okay? Learning is on the other case, the case where we, we might not be able to do that, right? We actually don't know all of these variables and we have to figure out what to behave in, right? So you only get one shot at life. What are you gonna do? You can't explore all of the possibilities and then decide what to do, okay? You're gonna have to do it on the way and learn what's the rewards for doing it, right? To either study for CS3244 or decide, you know, it's more uh, useful to study for another module, okay? So uh, we've just taught you value and policy iteration. That solves the planning problem, right? Because we need to know the MDP, okay? So if we don't know the MDP, that's not going to solve it, right? We need something else that's gonna to have to deal with the stochasticity of having not know our uh, script R and our script P, right? We don't have these two things, they're gone, bye. Okay, so we want to go fix that, okay? So actually it's not so difficult. We're gonna introduce a variation called Q learning, okay? We're gonna say, instead of having a model, okay? This was our model, okay? A model of how the rewards evolve, okay? We're going to learn it. And 
because we don't know exactly which state we're going to be in, we're going to also learn it. We're going to go say that there's a function delta s of a that's going to tell us what state we're going to end up in if we do this, okay? It's not going to be complete. This is an estimated function, okay? And so is this estimate, okay? We don't have the exact values for this, okay? We have to learn it through experience, okay? And much as the same way we did value iteration, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to pretend the same trick. We're going to say, we actually don't know what our optimal action value function is. But we're going to pretend as if we do. And then when we uh, learn a little bit more about our R and our delta, we can get it better, okay? So we're gonna to have to iterate, okay? But iteration has our cost because as soon as we do an action, we are actually doing that action, right? We're not simulating it in our head. We actually have to go interact with the environment, go do this A, go do this A, right? And then decide whether we get what we want, okay? So this is how it looks like, okay? We start in the environment. The environment says, hey, you're in S1, okay? Our agent thinks about, hey, we're in S1. Uh, what should we do? Mm. Okay, I don't know anything about S1. It's a new state to me, so I don't have a quality estimate for it, um, but I've got some A's. Okay, let's, let's decide to do action A1 in state one. Okay, that's our policy that we're gonna set, okay? So I say, okay, machine, go do A1. Okay, the machine does A1. The environment says, hey, look, you did A1, guess what? You're not in A1 anymore, you're in S2, okay? You're not in S1 anymore, you're in S2. Congratulations, you're in S2. And by the way, you got a reward. Here's your reward, it's R2, okay? So it sends back R2 and S2, okay? At, you know, time step two here, okay? And then the agent says, hey, whoa, we got some information back, right? Uh, we were in S1, we took action A1, and guess what? I got some reward for it. So I'm going to add that and change my estimate, change my estimate of what it means to have done A1 in state S1. So if I go back to S1 again, I know that A1 produces this result, okay? So I'm gonna update it. So originally I had this score, okay? And now I've updated to here, original, updated, okay? Well, in any case, I'm now in S2. I have to decide what to do, okay? So uh, I look it up, I decide maybe by random or, or, or by uniform or because I knew uh, certain things about S2, I decide the policy for S2 is to do A2, okay? So I get A2, the environment reacts again. Hey, you did A2 in S2, now you're in S3 and you observe the reward R3, okay? And so on and so forth, okay? So that's the idea of how online learning works in Q-learning, okay? So what we're trying to do, as we saw in this last slide, is pretty much keep estimating these pieces of information. We want to get better and better at estimating how good our Q value functions are, okay? So we're gonna have, uh, just like in our uh, value iteration, we're going to learn our Q functions, okay? So the Q hat just means our estimate, just like you saw in other lectures, you know, F hat is the same as H, you know, our approximated uh, um, optimal version of F uh, through our hypothesis, okay? So they're a vector of Q values, one for each state action pair, okay? It's again, now we're not thinking of a single state, we're thinking of a state action pair, all initially zero. And this is the whole algorithm. It's not so hard, right? The only thing is that we're going to say that we um, select some action, okay? Receive some reward from, from the environment, okay? We update what we learned about, oh, because we ended up in a new state, or maybe the same state, but anyways, we've gotten some information about our delta function, which says given the current state and our current action, what state do we end up in, okay? And then uh, we are updating our Q values, right? Our Q values are basically taking into account what is the reward that we were issued at that time step, okay? And then conditioned uh, by adding in all of the previous estimates that I had for being in this new state, um, S prime. Okay, that's all we're doing. Okay, great. So now if I do this process repeatedly, I will uh, end up having good estimates of Q. All right, and then I can be finished. Okay. So the key caveat that we're doing in this uh, part is here. Okay. We're gonna say that if we have rewards 
that are always greater than zero, okay? So some of the, most of the examples we had in this lecture don't count, right? Because there were negative rewards for staying in the, in the problem longer, okay? Um, then we can say that whenever we go through multiple steps, right? That we are always going to only accumulate more rewards, okay? That um, our Q hat only goes upwards, right? So we can say that at the beginning, we have uh, all of them initially zero, but we're trying to reach this optimal value, this uh, Q star. So if you can imagine it as a graph, okay, there's some magical Q star here for all of the things, and we start off at zero, and we're basically going up as we iterate, iteration, right? Okay, so we do more iterations, our Q values get estimate, but once they get to the optimal value and they don't change anymore, then we're done. Okay, and like we said before, once we have good Q values or Q, good V values, we can just re-engineer what the policy was that got us that in the first place. Okay. So to handle non-determinism is one of the problems, right? Well, so we said here, oh, hey, you know, um, actually our reward function and our uh, delta function are stochastic, right? So instead of uh, rewriting it entirely, okay, saying that we are going to re-estimate our Q, okay, as the reward function that I got this round, plus the uh, future rewards, okay, what I'm going to do is update it in a gradual manner, okay? So how do we do that? Um, the way we do it is we take this entire block equation here and we just put it over here, okay? So this says rewrite everything, okay? throw away any old information you had about it, okay? So this is trust new estimate, okay? And then the other part of it is here, okay? Which is my old estimate for being in this state, okay? So this is uh, historical records, right? Okay, so if I originally had Q hat for SA, I'm gonna say, oh, maybe I don't wanna wholesale replace it because I had a lot of prior experiences. Then I want to keep that information and gradually adjust my Q, okay? So it's, um, this is bridged by this blue alpha score, okay? Which is written over here, okay? It basically says the more times I have observed this Q value estimate, okay? The better I'm gonna trust my historical accuracy, okay? If I've not taken this action from this state before, then of course I'm gonna update it. But if I've taken it a hundred times and I suddenly get a, a really wild value for my Q, for example, I won the lottery, uh, but I know that most times when I play, uh, you know, whatever, uh, some lottery game, then I usually don't get a reward, right? So I play total most of the time, I don't get a reward. So probably I should stop playing it, right? Because this is basically saying that if I have a lot of observations, I should trust those observations more. Okay, and then for exploitation versus exploitation, uh, this is the second part, right? So uh, focusing on this line in the Q learning problem, we have to select an action, okay? So what action am I gonna pick, okay? Well, I can pick one that's greedy, okay? I can say, I always wanna go to the best restaurant that I know about, but what happens if I don't explore, right? And what happens if there's another restaurant that opened or um, something else happened that caused uh, some other restaurant that might be good to try opening, right? So um, maybe I should actually not always think about taking the maximum, okay? That's what greedy means, right? But um, reserve some small percentage of time to do something at random or do something with uh, respect to the potential utility that it could exhibit something new, okay? So that's the idea of this, what we call epsilon greedy policy, which is to say we are most of the time going to do the exploitation, all right? We wanna do good things most of the time. But in case we have fear of missing out, okay? Then we uh, should do some exploration, right? We should say, okay, well, my friends told me this is a good place to try. Uh, you know, I'll take a chance, I'll go, go take a look, okay? So there are lots of ways to actually do this type of experimentation better, but we haven't uh, looked at it. Okay, so that's pretty much the entire lecture. So I, I give you a longer version of it, sorry about that, but hopefully it's more clear, okay? So um, what I would like you to do is think about these six labels, you know, uh, one, two, three, oops, yeah. 
three, four, five, and six, okay? And try to, uh, in your own mind, decide where they uh, go on this diagram, right? So this is the same uh, diagram we saw at the beginning in the pre-lecture, where I have an environment. It gives an observation and reward coming out through this arc, okay? Then the agent has to decide what to do with it. It has to do an action. It can either do an action without reference to a model, okay? Or have a model and then simulate what to do and then take, take the action, okay? And hopefully, uh, if you think about it a little bit, uh, you should get something similar to this, okay? Not exactly, okay? Uh, of course, the, the arc here that has no model, it has to be model free, right? So this is the model-based one, okay? And uh, in many times, uh, we learn two different algorithms today. One that is model free because it doesn't have this uh, P and R variable. These things are missing. You have to learn them. So uh, we don't have a model for it. That's called key learning. In the case we have our fully specified MVP, that was value iteration or policy iteration. Okay. Uh, when we have a good model, okay, when we have a fully specified MVP or we have parameters that we're keeping around to um, uh, understand the environment and we are simulating it, then we can say we're solving a planning problem. Otherwise, what we are saying is that we have to learn on the go. We have to uh, understand more uh, parts of the state space. We have to do some exploration as well. Otherwise, we won't be able to get ourselves out of uh, loops where we have suboptimal behavior and that we call learning. Okay. So uh, that's the whole lecture. So I'm going to end there. And it's exactly six, uh, actually a little bit beyond six. And uh, we're going to go to any questions that you might have. OK, so I'm going to click to exit. OK, and then come back here. All right, so we only have, I think, one other question. OK, what is the difference between V subscript pi s and V superscript pi s. Actually, I'm sorry, I think there's uh, some notational problems in the slide. So if you can tell us where you saw them, then uh, let me know, I'll get that fixed. Otherwise, they should be identical, okay? Um, the superscripts and subscripts just tell you which pi you're talking about. Um, you know, in the case where you saw the star, that stands for optimal. Yeah, no differences, okay? So um, that's all I have for you today. Uh, you should be getting your midterm uh, back, at least the first two uh, MCQ, MRQ parts later this week, if we can uh, manage to get them all graded through the automatic framework. Um, otherwise, we hope you're uh, doing well with your projects and um, uh, we'll see you next week. Okay, oh, we have one more. Why is the policy evaluation equation different from the recursive one? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. So if you can unmute or tell me what you mean by that, that would be great. So I'm not sure which, which recursion one you mean. I mean, if we go back to the original slides here and we have two for, um, I have to share, sorry. I'm looking at myself and realizing that it's not on the screen anymore, okay. Okay, there it is. So in policy evaluation, we're doing this equation, right? Oops, can I annotate again? Yeah, okay. Which is to estimate the value function, right? Because we are actually trying to get a good idea of the value function for a particular policy, right? Because there's a policy on this slide that tells you which one we're talking about, right? When we're doing policy improvement, it's almost the same. So you see these two equations here? They are uh, almost identical, but they're optimizing different things. One is to say, uh, can I compute the right value function for a particular current policy, okay? And the other one is saying, um, can I compute whether there is a better policy to do given the current policy that I have, right? I'm basically looking at the set of things that I have now, okay? And choose a new policy that's going to take the um, maximum uh, of the utility values that I estimated. So this is uh, given the optimal estimate 
uh, v values, okay, for that pi, okay. So once I have the return from here, okay, the policy evaluation gives me my v, v pi, then I can decide which things to improve. Okay, I'm not sure whether that was the question that you asked, so I, I'm sorry if I missed it. Okay, so uh, if you uh, are not clear about that, please unmute and let me know. Why are the policy evaluation equations different from the Bellman equations? They're actually pretty much identical, okay? Uh, if you look at them, they are um, equivalent. It's just that uh, in the case of doing the evaluation uh, of both the policy as well as the value iteration, we are just recursively, uh, iteratively doing that until they're stationary. So they should be identical. They're not different, okay? Uh, I think the only difference is that in certain cases, when we're talking about an MRP or an MC, okay, meaning a Markov chain or a Markov reward process, we can solve them using a set of linear equations because there's no nonlinearity function, okay? Our nonlinearity here is the max, right? We can't, when we have a maximum sum, uh, function, it's, uh, you know, not differentiable and it's not a linear function, okay? So, that is the hard part, which means there is no closed form solution for it, okay? But you should see um, the equations that we have for the Bellman equations for the optimal part, the Bellman optimal part should be the same as what you see in the second half where we talk about value iteration, policy iteration, and Q learning, because those are all concerning getting the optimal values or optimal actions, okay? Uh, do you guys have any other questions? Uh, again, uh, feel free to unmute. Okay, so uh, we only have uh, eight of you left. So, um, you know, if there's anything else, uh, great. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to call it a day because it's uh, over six. Okay, you're most welcome, Li Shuo. Yeah, you're, you can, um, it, uh, I hope it was helpful and then you have spent the two hours productivity uh, productive in learning, uh, reinforcement learning synchronously. Okay, so um, that's it. Thank you everyone, have a good week. I'll see you uh, next week at the help session if you're coming. Bye.